सीताराम हनुमान बाबा सीताराम हनुमान Congratulations Thank you You did it <laughs> <laughs> At last Have you always the, been fascinated with the vinyasa? Yes. I've always been fascinated with the vinyasa and and for different reasons and different depths. I'll never forget uh it was probably 1990 or somewhere in there when I saw a tape of Patavi Joyce teaching like uh Tim Miller, Richard Freeman, you know, and um I've never seen anything like it the vinyasa the flow. It's hard for people to remember if you didn't do yoga back then or right 1990. Now vinyasa yoga is everywhere. It's it's just like uh you don't even think about it. Like the flow and um everything. It's just how you do yoga now. But in 1990 and before it wasn't like that at all. It was a completely static practice where being in the pose was what being in one pose at a time um either being going really slow kind of like a yin yoga type of um way of approaching it or like a iyengar yoga kind of led it the way with uh breaking down asanas like really like the front leg and the back leg and really aligning and and working uh, with the details of being in the pose with almost no detail about a transition. What was interesting though is that I was studying with um this woman Marie Svoboda who's like I loved her she's like one of my best uh, my original best teacher and she had a totally unique style of her own and it was based on movement. <laughs> she cared about the transition in a really different way than Ashtanga but um like for her it almost the whole thing ended when you stopped moving almost like that it 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 wasn't interesting anymore that it and so she would invent these kind of um different organic movements and things um that were so cool and and uh, I turned I I absorbed that without even really thinking about it much but then I saw this Ashtanga video with um this formal flow like it was built in to like that you do it between every pose you transition with uh you know jump through jump back and up dog down dog and like <laughs> you die, you jump into the pose and stuff you know and um and so i just got into that without even thinking about um meta not not thinking about it just doing it right and um just loving the led class because you just like especially cuz that was my introduction to ashtanga was um uh, just where I went to LA and learned right from Patavi Joyce the first time and so and his led class was always just so uh just so based on flow and um like it was an incredible trance that he would put you in because of the background that he had with Marie even if you weren't conscious of it when you were doing when you were introduced to the the flow of the primary series and the vinyasas no. were you thinking about how to get into your postures yet no no not even oh. not even at all no and i ba- i did it all on athleticism it took a long time to really start to analyze um things but one thing that i did do which is you see cuz when patavi joyce led a class You see there was all this um instruction within his inflection like what he would accent and how he would um say things and like he would say things like you know you'd he'd go uh so he'd go head up inhale exhale like and he would emphasize that exhale a lot of people didn't catch on to what that meant like that the that the intonation of that exhale yeah like was... what was actually What was the, what was that instruction telling you to do but it wasn't only telling you to exhale it was a body position it was telling you like it was um kind of guiding you through the structure of the vinyasa there's a lot of extra movements and um extra breaths within some of the vinyasas but as a teacher you can see that people miss it all the time they don't they don't catch it at first you could think well who cares right because it's like uh 
it seems like it's just like almost like Simon says. You're just memorizing this sequence, and and so getting it right is only just a matter of like, you know, meditation or being aware. But this is not true at all. You see, and this is what's amazing about um, that vinyasa, the formal vinyasa system of Ashtanga, because it is those within those vinyasa positions with the extra movements and extra breaths um, is hatha yoga technology, right? So the, there's, mm. there's like bandhas and um, like, because my Patavi Joyce used to say that Ashtanga yoga is all including. And, and what he meant by that was it was including all, all the technology of hatha yoga. Like if you practiced Ashtanga, you'd learn pranayama, you'd learn bandhas. And you learn these auxiliary aspects to the um, to what constitutes hatha yoga. But I also feel that as I watched people practice as, as a teacher, that it because um, there's also the saying like "Do your practice and all is coming," and part of me it like I think that's a misrepresented statement. It, it's it it's more, to me it's more of a general statement of like. Just get on your mat consistently and you're going to succeed, right? But, but when it gets down to the specifics of, are you going to use primary series to learn Uddiyana Bandha? Like, th th is th that's not what m is meant by all is coming. Like, you have to uh, dig into the, the, the system, the structure of the vinyasa to learn Uddiyana Bandha and to, um, to get the benefit of the idea that um, all is included in the Ashtanga practice. And so that, that's what I slowly unfolded was, and articulated, is that, um, so like in the bare bones uh, presentation of the vinyasa, those nuances are missed. Like, you, they're, they're literally missed. When you're just listing out the positions. And with a f one photograph of one guy in the pose. Yeah. Yeah, that you don't catch it. In my book, I've, I've included this whole timeline of, of extra breaths, and then the extra movements are, there's photographs of people doing it. Um, every single vinyasa, every, every one is represented. And like I said, it's not just a, member, a matter of memorizing something. There's technology there. And so, and I've, um, I, it took that long, 15 years to write this book be, for, from the layout perspective of like, how do you actually capture that and make it um, accessible and clear and then articulate it in, in not like big paragraphs of information, right? Yeah. In small little chunks that, um, that get you to be able to do it. Yeah, and I guess I would also say, because I've been privy to this process, yeah. I would also say that part of that time was also you, well, practicing, researching, traveling around the world and seeing in all these different shalas what is going on. Yeah. Where are the students missing? Like, where is it a un uh, unanimously there's a hole, yeah, you know, yeah. within the system right. that needs to be filled and... I mean, I'm assuming a lot of it is also just you because you didn't have this book to learn from. So yeah. a lot of it was you, you know, reading the Hatha Yoga Pradipika, being like, okay, there's this thing called bandhas, and then continuing to practice primary, you know, the series, and then figuring out, like, that, the, that this vinyasa led to this bandha. Is that... Oh, yeah. Me, I've spent countless hours working with the those vinyasas, um, and I'm discovering, like, that out of all the ways there is to learn to do Uddiyana Bandha, stopping at the halfway point in the midst of the flow through the series, that's the easiest. <laughs> that, it's the easiest by far, hmm. because you... Because you're, you're thrown into this um, dynamic situation with your body and with your breathing, and so you're, you're, you've got a leg up, as it were. You, you've, got, you've got an advantage already for, like, how to do it. Like, and that's, it's interesting because when he says uh, all including, and when he said that, and when he said do your practice and all is coming, there's a certain truth to that. That, yeah, that 
Yeah, because you could say that's what you did. Yeah, and you <laughs> and if you really go into it deep enough, you are going to discover the whole thing, the whole of yoga. But but you can't do it cursorily. You gotta really delve into it. And and so that book for me represents this really delving into it, like deeply, and um, and then trying to help someone to like give them the like the the roadmap of like if you want to know what like you can go because because in this book there is a photograph a caption and at least one bullet point but usually more for every single vinyasa in the primary series so like you said i traveled everywhere and saw so many people practice and almost universally aliveness and consciousness of the vi vinyasa is absent. So it's almost, yeah. there's so many vinyasas, so many lift ups and jump backs and up dog, down dog, jump through, that the, the, it just becomes this sort of throwaway thing that, that you do. You, and you do it by habit and not by, uh, not skillfully and not bringing consciousness or, um, or like singling out each, each time you lift up and jump back and do these things. And so, and so that book, it's got a photograph of every single jump back and jump through and a brand new set of instructions. Upward dog is described 75 different times. <laughs> right, which in that book. for sure is something that you've spoken to me about that, you know, with some students, you're trying like every different avenue to try to be able to click in to have some sort of instruction penetrate, right? And yeah, for them yeah. to respond. Yeah. And so even your textbook has many, 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 many different yeah. ways that hopefully will trigger something. Yeah, and also illustrate to you that the world is, is constantly changing. We know that, just of obvious physics, right? And so that means every time you do a jump back, that's a new thing. And, the, and meditation is to get with it and, and know that and be right there with that new moment and that new experience. What's weird is we do this repetitive practice to get in touch with this constant change. And that book illustrates it. It, it, it keeps describing it in, in just a little bit different way. And it's very monotonous in one sense, but in another sense, it's um, every time you come up out of a pose, you stop. That's, that's the vinyasa protocol. And then you formally get ready to jump back. And then you lift up and et cetera. You go through that whole process time after time, each time new, no matter how many times you do it. And, um, and so to communicate that in a book is formidable. In the introduction, you tell this story about when you were at the Shala in Mysore and in what, 97 or something like that? Yeah, so there was a conference. It, was, it wasn't called conference then though. There was no formal name for it. It was just people gathered together um, at uh, Tavi Joyce's house, um, often just on the front step, but sometimes like right in the front room of his house. And I was sitting across from Tavi Joyce and, um, and somehow he, he just said to me, like, among all the voices and things that were going on, the kind of commotion, he just was like, uh, quickly you do. That, that's the method. <laughs> and, like, he really, and it was like, um, he really wanted me to hear that. Like, it was very, um, very, just him to me, right? And, um, and so, to me, that, um, it's funny, that little thing, that one little statement opened up this whole world that made that book. And it's quite extraordinary because, because so much is behind that statement. And um, because it, it didn't mean just go fast through your postures. <laughs> of course it didn't mean that. That would just be stupid, right? And that's not what he, it's not, he was, because many times he told me, no, hur don't hurry, don't hurry. And, um, and, I, and he, that was a general instruction that he gave. So it wasn't about doing it quickly. It was more, it was a, that was his broken English. And it, it, it was about dynamism. 
It was a, it, the method, he was saying, this is dynamic. And you see, and this is one, something I also, one of the, a, a major thing of my teaching and that I've observed in um, students, which is that along with doing transitions um, by rote, kind of by habit, and just unconsciously, because there's so many, people routinely repeat doubtful movements. They could um, hesitate and go slow and try to think their way into poses and um, as a habit, you see. And, and to me, the, this is one of the, the most important things about vinyasa because it's a training in action. That's what it is. It's uh, because it's it's movement. It's like you uh, and and it leads to what I, I have a set of asana principles and um, and this book is devoted to the second asana principle, which is that um, for ev every transition is pro approached from a single mentality, and that mentality I call it the crouch and spring. Okay, and so it, it and it means that when we repeat these things every day, not to um, continue to do them doubtfully, but to learn from the repetition and gain skill and confidence in our actions. For every asana, there's a certain number of vinyasas, a set, like five vinyasa for triangle pose, or 22 vinyasa for jhana shirshasana. For triangle pose, only two of them are when you're in the pose, vinyasa two and four. Okay, but those other ones, you see, the, the, those are setup positions. So the position one is a setup position to going into the pose and staying. And the end position three is a setup for the second sign. And so the setup is the crouch. And this is where you prepare for action before you act. And this is what, what vinyasa is supposed to teach you. Okay, but, and if you're not careful, you, you can do Ashtanga just um, very monotone and not um, picking up on that and not marking the, the, these different moments that are um, kind of formalized into the system with these vinyasas. And then the movement into the pose is the spring. And the reason that I call it the crouch and spring is because, so for one, there's a buildup of energy before you move. And there's a consciousness of moving, just like an animal does. Like, animals don't just move. They, especially if they're on the hunt and they want to, they're targeting something, right? They, they get low, they hunker down, and they build up, and they get ready, and then they go, and they, they and like an arrow shooting to a target, they, they target their movement, right? And this is what you're meant to do in Ashtanga. And, and this is what he meant by quickly. It's like you, you don't hesitate on going into your mm. pose. Hesitation and doubt is a sign of a lack of skill, a lack of mastery. And, um, and it's something you're trying to eliminate um, by repetition and practice. And, and so that language and that um, mentality of getting you to, to, to take a risk, because there's risk involved in a crouch and spring. As you see, because animals, they, they're quite nimble and agile, right, and graceful, but they also fail sometimes. Like, you can see them, they crash and burn. Uh, it happens because when you spring into action, that's a commitment. You're, you've committed your forces to, to a, a definite course of action. And, um, and this is what you have to do in practice. And, and what's so beautiful about it is that it, it's a physical training in like sound movement. And, and I also teach in the book that your tr the, the quality of your transition determines the quality of your pose. Okay, and it's very common to completely separate those things, to not even think that how you get into your pose is influencing the result of the pose. But this becomes a, a much greater subject of action itself, of behavior, and how we act in the world. That it's the same thing, that we, we have to prepare when we're going to 
make any move, like like simple things like cooking or driving, but going to increasingly more complex things of negotiating the important um, aspects of our life. Like relationships require skillful action. Our work, um, evolution of our work life requires skillful action. And this mentality of the crouch and spring transfers. It's not just a physical athletic thing. It's a it's a emotional thing. It's a rational thing. It's a um, thinking thing. It's a um, how you operate in the world thing. Yeah, and I think what's so what you've done so marvelously in the book is that, and also you know, seriously, like applause to Ashley Lowe, the book layout <laughs> book designer. Yeah. Um, you have managed to articulate within the complex layers of the book layout and your writing, the simple, just crouch and spring in this position, you know, and spring into this position. Wrap to your, your arm around and straighten that leg. And, yeah. Yeah. All the way through to then these sections of the book, book to, that are called vinyasa meta views. Well, where, just wait though, because there's a whole breathing aspect, an energetic thing that's um, laced in with the physical instructions. The meta view yeah. comes a, as, a, as the final layer. It's the so final the, layer, yeah. yeah. So there, it's called vinyasa meta view. And, it, and so there's, uh, at the end of um, the series of bullet points in um, some of the columns, so it's not everyone, it's just once in a while there's this, what I call the meta view, and, and, so it, and it's the most global, the most universal application of these um, very physical doings that you're um, repeating and working on, but the, it, and it's going all the way to um, the spiritual dimension, like and the the pith of one's life. Like, how do you? Because this is a big question about life. Like, how can our actions um, lead us towards the life that we want to live? Right. This is standard um, standard, but one of the greatest challenges that we face in life is. Um, having our actions lead us to desirable results and, and, um, and deepening meet more meaningful and rewarding um, experiences, right? And it is our actions that uh, have a huge amount to do with the results that we get. And that how you wrap your arm in Marie Chiasana C... <laughs> yeah! You know, that is you practicing that more that esoteric skill. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And and they're very connected. Like those and and not enough um, credit has been given to that. Like we tend to separate things. It's like our practice is over here and then the philosophy or um, just the more meaningful kind of pithy aspects of our life are over here. And that somehow like organically just practicing is good for you, which is true, but it can also be much more targeted and, um, and specific. One of the things that I love about the book is how user-friendly it is. So it's true that it's 200 pages and it's you know packed with information, but the layout is organized in such a way that you feel that it's bite size. You feel that you can just take this little tiny bullet point and I'm just gonna contemplate that today and use that information on my mat. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. not it's not like it's just boom, no, a wall of no, text. No. You can literally take any page and open it and then read one little line and like get Inspired you know, for the day, yeah, or for the practice. But I, that was another reason it took fifteen years because I, I I cut away everything extraneous. And also, Ashley, the layout we worked on that exhaustively to to lay it out um, so that it's just crystal clear and easy to follow. So, what does this book mean to you, <laughs> like both personally and professionally? Partly it means, well, it's helped me take a giant step towards fulfilling my work, 
in this life. I feel that like that um, this is something that's the the most important uh, to me. Like what 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 do I have to contribute like um, here in this life, and what do I have to share with people? And and it's it's just so interesting. My my path has taken me into yoga, and then Ashtanga yoga, and then. Um, and then into this in-depth exploration of Ashtanga Yoga that is completely unique. And um, it, as far as I know, that what, what's, what I've written down in that book and, what I, and what's like my platform of teaching, it's not been written down before. I know it can sound bold or whatever, but we are trying to evolve, every, everyone in every discipline, right? And... I don't believe that yoga is, it was better in the past and it was like some ultimate perfection and then now we're trying to get back to that perfection or something. What I believe is that we're tr every generation is trying to take it a little bit further, is to evolve the science, evolve the art, and, um, and the, the, no one's ever got the last word on it. Patabi Joyce and Lino, and they... They brought Ashtanga to a certain place, and, and other teachers too. But, but I'm talking about like on paper, like written down, like what's going to be carried forward. And I think of it like explorers. And um, to unearth or discover that system of Ashtanga, it was a, uh, truly astounding. But then that was, it was almost like uh, coming to a, a wilderness, discovering um, the new world or something. But the, but the stopped before they actually explored the new world. Well, that's how you feel about yeah. the, uh -huh. okay, I feel the past, like yeah. That, the, my book, I actually explored it. I opened it up. I went, okay, yeah, there's fourth position. But what, and, and where they said, there it is, just fourth position. I've said, no, fourth position has four different, three movements and extra breaths that go with it. And this is what happens in those extra movements and breaths, where that, nobody did that before. Nobody wrote that down. I feel like blessed or something, but also like somehow, I don't know, fulfilled. Like, you know, like I did what my job or what something that was important for me to do. Yeah. And, um, and there's more, but this is monumental. Like, I mean, it took 15 years, and I can just go, wow, you know, that, that happened. That, that major milestone happened. And, and also, I have these other books. This is my fifth book or something. And I love the, the other books, but this one is different. This one, it, 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 because it's so specific to the discipline that I have devoted myself to. And, and it's my contribution to the discipline, like that's completely unique. Like I said, nobody, nobody out there could have wrote that book in that way but me. And, um, and, I, and I find it valuable, like um, that interpretation and that perspective um, to bring to the, to the table and, um, and to, for the whole um, collective evolution of Ashtanga going forward. That's, a, and whatever, it feels maybe I'm, you know, a legend in my own mind or whatever, but that, I, that's how, how I feel about it. Isn't it fascinating how at 28 or whatever, 26, you know, you had this class with Marie Sabota who was very much into how you would get into a posture and how you would get out. Yeah. And then you forgot about that. I but forgot. then totally somewhere like yeah. somewhere along the past, you know, what, 30 years, that started to Circle come in. Like around. thank God you had that foundational kind of work, right? That yeah. was enforced in you. Yeah. And from the beginning. Like yeah, yeah. from the beginning. Yeah, yeah. And Adil Pakiavala was another really uh, influential teacher that helped me with it, and then also it's funny because Richard Freeman too. And when I first uh, met Richard Freeman, I, I signed up for a workshop. I was in California, and I took the Friday night class, a weekend workshop, and then I saw, I withdrew from it. It was too I, I couldn't relate to it because 
because I was just too into Ashtanga, and he was into articulating Ashtanga it, to a very high degree. But then I ended up, I did study with him some, and, um, and I obviously circled way back around to that. that um, and Of appreciating and appreci articula uh, the articulation. The, the essentiality, okay, that Ashtanga is dangerous if you don't um, totally uh, investigate everything you're doing. It's, uh, it's literally like um, harm because you're putting such strong forces into play with um, the series and the flow and the sweat and the heat. And you can go places like amazing. But, and if you're kind of younger and fit and able... But um, that can come back to bite you. And so, um, so that's another reason that I've written this book and why I really try to impress upon my students to um, that the whole crouch and spring is that, that um, the way you get into your pose matters. Like, and repeat what you want to reinforce. These are the things that I'm, I'm teaching. My hope <laughs> is that... This book will influence, you know, the future generations that this can start to become part of the tradition. Yeah, I don't know about that. There's certain taboos within Ashtanga that that book breaks. I'd say maybe the biggest one is the whole silence thing. In the typical Mysore room, there's no talking. You don't verbalize, like, the actions of getting into a pose or... There's something very, just, um, a, th th that's not acceptable. I understand, except for here's what I would say to that. You see, this is what's, what's hard, is that to practice in silence um, is a very advanced thing to do. And you can't, abs you cannot assume this, uh, that you're an advanced practitioner. And I, and it's funny because somehow yoga, is, we think of ourselves as, as exempt. And maybe it's true in other disciplines, I don't know. But to me, the primary series, I say it, it's akin to a somatic Mozart symphony. Like the, you know, like the violin, the first chair, like the, the, the amount of skill and repetition and um, targeted practice that you need to be able to play a musical instrument well is the same with the primary series. And when a, a musician that does, they don't practice by just repeating the, the piece over and over from start to finish every day. And then that that's how you learn it. No, there's a lot of strategies. Well, so to think that you can just uh, kind of get into a trance when you practice and just flow every day, and that that's going to um, teach you, it's going to really lead you to master um, a series. It's just not realistic. And so things have to be broken down and articulated and, um, and really thought through, and um, different uh, things, like small sections have to be repeated, or transitions, or things. But eventually, you can practice in silence. Um, but what the requirement to get to that stage um, is great. And, and then also, it can be cyclical. You can practice sometimes. Like, uh, my ratio, I would say, is something around once a week. Once a week, cut loose, flow. Don't break it down. Don't think too much. Um, especially as you gain more and more experience and skill and mastery. But, but then five days a week, you've got to think and think and think and think and really uh, break down what you're doing and, um, and work at it and find the problem areas and um, strategize and, um, and be able to map it out. Like, what, what is really... Uh, going on here and and so that's to me I would say the biggest mistake is to assume uh, mastery that's not there and that takes years to get 
um, and, that, and doesn't come just by repeating. If you really want to know yoga, you got to put in the time, and you've got to really delve into each transition, not just by doing it once per day, but thinking it through, and uh, like the legs, the arms, the pelvis, the spine, what is going on here, and the breath, and the movement, and, and the stopping, and the forces in play, and the elements, and there's so many um, aspects that you, you have to explore and um, become kind of boundlessly curious about. So it's kind of limitless, the, the exploration. Uh, one of my guitar heroes, he's, he's a singer, songwriter, you know, kind of a bluegrass musician, but he's also original. His name was Norman Blake. He's an amazing uh, guitar player and singer and songwriter, and um, and and formidable, like very very skilled musician. Um, and um, and he goes, yeah, I try to practice a little every day. You know, like there's a certain sort of laid back. Um, humbleness to the art, but don't be fooled, right? <laughs> you, you, he, that man practices guitar and singing, and like he goes in his room or wherever he goes and delves into the art. And, and he practices it probably smartly. Yes. That's why I feel like this book is such a good guide. Yeah, and because I'm with you. I wish that it uh, it can become come into the mainstream of Ashtanga more. Um, and I think there's some progress in that direction, but there could be more. Well, the more for sure. I mean, the more teachers, right, that can grab onto these teachings and then are passing them down, it is going to become more of a norm. Yeah, and. See, and see, there's tricky parts to it all because, like, partly what's so masterful about, say, Lino's book is just how simple it is. Like, you can, that book about Ashtanga, that book, if Ashtanga's around in 2,000 years, that book will be around. Yeah. And, and it will faithfully, like, if you follow that book, you'll be able to do, you know, the series. Okay? And, and so. I've tried to preserve that, like the, the actual system, like vinyasa for vinyasa. And, and the danger, though, of like kind of uh, opening up the details and um, kind of fleshing out and analyzing is it becomes more complex and harder to keep track of and, and everything. And so, so I value this kind of core structure of Ashtanga. But I also believe it needs this uh, additional knowledge to complete it. Like, uh, for safety, uh, for longevity, uh, to reach more students. Like, uh, there's just a lot of reasons why it, that this um, extra teaching or this, uh, these fleshed out aspects to the technology are needed yeah. and, and belong going forward um, as people study and evolve. You know, when you go and look at early Picasso paintings or something, right? I mean, his, the guy totally knew how to draw a hand <laughs> yeah. to perfection, right? Like, Yo, this is, yeah. he didn't start with his cubism paintings, right? Yeah. I mean, he started as a 12 year old learning how to draw fingers. Yeah, yeah. And then it evolved, it op that allowed him to open up into this, to these whole other worlds. Yeah, yeah. And I exactly. feel like that's what's so cool yes. about this book. It, this it your... lets you, it gives you the tools that then you can go, all right, and you can go open up into your own world. Yeah, I mean, that's what's amazing. It truly is a, it's a strong, just 
beautiful foundation in Hatha Yoga. It, it really gives you the grounding in it, and for real. And, and it allows you to go off and do your thing, like safely and knowledgeably and like even um, like, it, it, like you'll know how within yourself how to do it. Like um, even though it will be different, you know, like because every, right, every, the further everyone goes in their path, the more unique and original and um, singular it, it is and unlike anybody else's. And but you need that good foundation that's a big uh, universal, right? And then once you've got that, these kind of universal things, then you, you go. And this is the Lifetime book. You can, it, it's got so many layers, so deep in so many ways. Sita Ram Hanuman Baba Sita Ram Hanuman Baba Sita Ram Hanuman